I'm Rita Sukrit, and I'm Canada Lead for Hemsley Fraser. We, I've worked at L&D more than 20 years in various industries and across, the, and in many countries. Some of the industries I've worked in are chemical, oil and gas, professional services, and not-for-profit. On the agenda tonight, I'll take. Really? <laughs> Do you want me to come in the center? What's that? I mean, I don't have children. <laughs> tonight, tonight, I'm going to take you on a journey on the evolution of corporate learning, and this is going to tie in nicely with your presentation with the leadership. I'll discuss methods and principles of learning in the workplace. I'll also share current, some, some current stats and also conclude with a business framework as well as an employee framework for you to consider if you want to enrich the employee experience for engagement and performance. Sounds good? Is it better? Louder. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose my voice tonight. All right, a little bit about Hempsey Fraser. We've been around for more than 31 years in the UK as our headquarters. We are in throughout the United States. We're in Germany and about a year and a half in Canada, which is where I am. Um, here are some of our products and services that we offer. But the last couple of years during the pandemic, the three things areas we've been really focusing on are the assessing the employee performance, in introducing learning in the flow of work, and of course, future of work strategies. Okay, so let's, I want to I talk a little bit about, give you some stats here. The past few years, we've been, um, last year, roughly a third of employees changed jobs and the mobility trend will continue. We believe in 2023, it will be the year of innovation about reskilling and moving people into new jobs, into new careers, into new teams and our projects. And we see a redesign of jobs and the organization themselves. So we want to invest in employees really for the skills gap. We need to consider the technical skills and the non-technical skills. And non-technical skills mean your human skills or your power skills or your soft skills. And we also want to consider organizational agility to adapt and to prepare for future of work, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic. It was a major disruption to not just companies, but the entire world. I want the evolution of learning. This is this slide here, I'm just gonna zip through it, but there's a lot of information. Starting on the right side from 1998, you can see learning started in e-learning, but prior to 1998, we can safely say it was a classroom-based type of learning. You had an instructor, they'd come in and they would teach. By, twen by 1998, it's e-learning and blended learning. By 2005, talent-driven, where companies would invest in high potentials, they would select employees, prep them, train them for, to be future leaders in the organization. By 2012, we actually saw the invent of digital learning. Most people think that started during the pandemic, but that's not true. It was way before that. And by 2022, trends that we were doing in learning started to emerge because of the pandemic. Things like learning in the flow of work and designing for the five moments of need. So as we come out of the pandemic in 2023, Learning has now shifted to a modernized version, growth, capability academies, skills, and the, what modern learning really means is looking at the, uh, the learner, how they interact in the world, and what, how they want to learn, their preferred style or methods. And that's what modern learning is about. Tying in with the previous slide, I want to go through quickly some of the concepts in learning and development. If we look at the pedagogy, that's basically classroom. But in our world and adult learning, pedagogy is really how children learn. You have an instructor, they disseminate all the information to your students. The next uh, category, andragogy, Malcolm Knowles in, brought in this term, andragogy, this is how adults learn. And then in 2000, Two Australians, Hayes and Kenyon, introduced hutagogy, 
which is truly the next step up from andragogy and its self-determined learning. So we have pedagogy, which is instructor-centric, andragogy, which is content, lots of content, and then hutagogy, which is learner-centricity. And I know we've all heard that term in the last couple of years. Now we don't want to, the last term on here, I want to bring it to our attention because in the workplace there are up to nine generations. The traditionalists, or what we refer to them, are the seniors or the elders. They're the garagogy. So when we design learning, we've got to factor in all these, I guess, generations in the workplace. On average, a company has between five and six generations. The trends, the stats here truly indicate a shift from the employer to the employee. When we look at the stats, the number one reason why people are leaving is because they're not getting their growth opportunities in the organization. 70% of candidates prefer to be evaluated for the future of work. Never mind what's done in the past, you've got to think future forward. And two out of three employees have quit their jobs because of the lack of growth. Yet 90% said they would have stayed if they had that growth opportunity. Trends to consider in 2003, it's easy. The skills, career growth, employee experience, and understand that we are still in chaos. We haven't really come out of the pandemic. But this chaos that we're in is really going to help us define our future of work. Yours and mine are never going to be the same, and that's the beauty of coming. We get to push that reset button and define how we want to def the future of work to look like. New ways of learning, none of this should be foreign to us in the flow of work, which is really, really, that came into from the pandemic. People were removed from their offices, brought into their homes, so now you couldn't take them and put them in a classroom and train them, so we had to design methodologies or what we call EPSS, job aids to help them in the flow of work because they're really on their own. Technology will always be part of learning. Collaboration is big and I think a lot of that stemming from the pandemic where we were isolated, we worked in, in a remote setting, we, people want to collaborate, want to share knowledge, want to learn from each other. And finally, data, but tell it like a story your CEOs or your executives, if you can paint that picture in a story format, they will fall for it. You, you, you don't even have to defend your case for learning and development. Now, I, I, coming to, to the end, I want to go through the business framework that we have used at Hemsley Fraser. And I've looked at data with our clients over the last couple of years. And I picked the five pillars here, but there are others, and they, they differ for each company. The one thing I want to talk about is the bottom diagram where you have a current state, you, want to, you know where you are now, and you have a future desired state, and you want to figure out how you get there, and these pillars are going to guide you. But this is a model that's used not only in L&D, learning and development, change management uses it. And that the centerpiece, how will I get there, that's the transition phase. In business, this is our business framework, in learning and development, that's the gap or the needs analysis. So let me quickly run through the five pillars and tell you what they, how they work in L&D. First of all, the strategy is identifying the strengths and weaknesses in your organization, but don't forget about the, your employee landscape. They too have their own ethics, they have their own values, they have their own beliefs, and if it doesn't align with the organization, they will leave. So you've got to really consider that strategy and include them. The skills, we've talked about this, I think oh, everyone in the, tonight has been mentioning about skills. What are today's skills? What are going to be your future skills? How do we build these skills and how are we going to develop them in our employees? Third is the strength. When you look at the, the strengths, look at both employee strengths and the organization strengths. And then for structure, you're always looking at both employee and organization. Before, everyone was focused on the organization, never the employee, but the times are changing and the employees are now holding the ace card and they're actually driving, they're in the driver's seat. Finally, with support, as with anything you do, you always have to have a support mechanism. 
in learning, in change, it doesn't matter. So make sure you have a strong support mechanism, mechanism for your employees. This is the employee framework. There shouldn't be any surprises here from well-being to appreciation, I'm working backwards, collaboration, there shouldn't be any surprises here. This all is coming, stemming right from the pandemic. What I do want to do, what I want to do is spend a minute and talk about the growth mindset, the very first one. So employees that have or believe they have a growth mindset, they're actually the ones that you want in your organization. They embrace lifelong learning. They confront challenges and they view obstacles as an opportunity. They strive for improvement in their performance and that ultimately increases the organization's performance. But if you have an employee that has a fixed mindset, it really means that they, they believe that their talent, their intelligence, and their capabilities are static and unchangeable. And this hinders their growth in an organization, which ultimately impacts the business objectives. The last slide I want to leave you with is the stats here, and everyone's bringing out amazing stats. Gartner did a research, uh, they did their research last year, and by October, November, they produced their report, and I took it right from Gartner. You can see by 2025, 85 million jobs are going to be displaced by artificial intelligence or machinery, and 97 new million roles will emerge. So it's fine, you're going to lose, you're going to get. By 2030, one billion people in the world will need to be reskilled. Just think about that, it's staggering. So don't underestimate skills and where you need to be to upskill, reskill, new skill, cross skill, call it what you will, but you've got to really consider your skilling for your employees. And I say this every time because I think it's so true and I'm going to leave this with you. The top supporting priorities, they initially started with 10, by December, they whittled it down to five, and by January, they said, look, if you can't concentrate on 10 or five, at least consider the three here. First is the leadership and manager effectiveness. Second is the organization and change. And third is the employee experience. So everything everyone's been talking about here tonight links to these three. But check this out, right? Companies hire people, people quit their, their leaders. How true is that? On that note, I'm going to hand it back to Bill.